For more physics related videos, please subscribe. In this video, we will go over Al Biruni's method for measuring the radius of the Earth. I've rated the physics level in this video as easiest. Now, previously, I posted a video on Eratosthenes' method, which was the first ever measurement of the size of the Earth, and it basically consisted of three steps. First, you pick two locations that have the same longitude. Then you measure the change in latitude between those two locations by measuring the difference in altitude of some celestial object, like the sun or a star or something. And finally, you measure the physical distance between the two locations. And with these three pieces of information, you can measure the radius or the circumference of the Earth. Now this method is pretty simple, but it has one flaw, which is this third step here, because how accurately could you really measure the distance between these two locations? especially considering that you don't want the distance on ground, you want the distance as the crow flies. So you need a long, flat expanse of land that stretches probably at least 60 miles or 100 miles or so. Because if you have any hills or mountains that you have to climb over or around, it's not going to translate to the correct distance. Albiruni's method circumvents this problem. In fact, supposedly he came up with this method precisely because he didn't want to have to deal with walking hundreds of miles across the desert in order to measure it. So, a little background on this guy. He lived around the turn of the 11th century. He was born in the city of Kath in modern-day Uzbekistan, which today is called Biruni, renamed after him. He carried out his experiment, however, in modern-day Pakistan. So let's take a look at this method. First thing you're going to need to do is measure the height of a mountain. But not just any mountain. You need a mountain that's overlooking a flat expanse of land, and more precisely, you have to be able to see the horizon. So if you've got any mountains or hills in the way, that's not going to work. Okay, now that we have our mountain, how do we measure it? So first what you're going to do is you're going to stand back some distance D from the base of the mountain, or I should say from the base of the axis of the mountain. You don't actually need to know what this distance is, so you just stand and look at the mountain. And then you measure the angle above the horizontal that your line of sight makes to the top of the mountain. We're going to call this angle alpha. Then you walk back some distance L, this time you measure this distance, and again you measure the angle to the top of the mountain, which we're going to call beta. Now look, the ground is perpendicular to the axis of the mountain, so that means we have two right triangles here. First we have this big right triangle that has a height of H and a base of L plus D. And if you remember your trigonometry, opposite over adjacent is the tangent of the angle, so here we're going to have that the tangent of beta is h over l plus d, which I'm going to rewrite as h divided by tan beta equals d plus l. Now, we do the same thing for this smaller triangle that uses angle alpha, and we have that the tangent is h over d, which again I'm going to rewrite as h over tan alpha equals d. Now recall I don't know what d is, so let's subtract these two equations in order to get rid of it, and this is going to give us h over tan beta minus h over tan alpha equals l. 1 over tangent is cotangent, so this can be rewritten as h times cotangent of beta minus h times cotangent of alpha equals L. I can pull out an h from the left side of the equation, as it's a common factor, and then I can divide by cotangent beta minus cotangent alpha to find that the height of the mountain is L divided by cotangent beta minus cotangent alpha. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask that you hit that subscribe button and maybe share it with a few friends. Now that I know the height of my mountain, Albiruni says, if this is the Earth with the mountain on top of it, and the Earth has a radius r, if I climb to the top of the mountain and look at the horizon, then my line of sight will be tangent to the Earth at that point. And I can measure this angle below the horizontal, which I'm going to call theta. Albiruni then says, if I draw a radius to the horizon, then it will be perpendicular with my line of sight. And now I've created a right triangle, which has a base of r, and a hypotenuse of r plus h. And the angle between the two I'm going to call phi. But look, the horizontal is 90 degrees to the axis of the mountain. And so the angle between my line of sight and the axis of the mountain is just 90 minus theta. But that's also the third angle in my right triangle, so it's also 90 minus phi, and therefore angle phi is just theta that I've measured. Now recall that cosine of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, and so that means that I have that r over r plus h equals cosine theta. 
I can multiply both sides by r plus h, and then bring all the r terms to one side, and then divide by 1 minus cosine theta to get that the radius of the Earth is h cosine theta divided by 1 minus cosine theta, which I can rewrite as h divided by secant theta minus 1. In this final step, I've just divided top and bottom by cosine theta, and use the fact that 1 over cosine theta is secant theta. Now you understand why we can't have any mountains on the horizon, because if we couldn't see it, then this method wouldn't work. So Albiruni carried out his experiment, and measured the angle of his line of sight to be 34 arc minutes, and I actually don't know what the height of his mountain was. But whatever it was, he came up with the radius of the Earth being just under 13 million cubits. One cubit is somewhere between 46 to 56 centimeters, and we don't really know because that's debated among historians. This was a problem we had with Eratosthenes' measurements as well. So converting this to kilometers, we get that he measured the radius of the Earth to be somewhere between about 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers. Modern measurements of the Earth give an average radius of 6,372 kilometers. I say average because the Earth is not a perfect sphere, and the radius is a little shorter at the poles than it is at the equator. This means that Albiruni's result was somewhere between 8% shorter to 12.5% longer than the average modern measurement. Whatever the actual measurement was, clearly his method is superior to Eratosthenes. First off, it's more practical, as you can do it in one place, and you don't have to worry about measuring the distance between two cities that could be hundreds of miles apart. All you gotta do is hike up a mountain, which doesn't even have to be very high. More importantly, it's more accurate, as you can measure the height of the mountain and the angle theta very precisely. But actually, there's a problem with this method. First off, how do you know that the land that you're looking over when you're looking at the horizon is actually flat, or I should say, actually level? It could be on a very gradual incline, and you don't need a very tall mountain to see 100 miles out which even with a gradual incline could result in a significant error in the height of your mountain. So ideally, if you could do this overlooking water, then you could be sure that it was level. But there's a bigger problem. You see, if this is the Earth, and you've got a mountain on top of it, the Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere, and that atmosphere is thicker at the surface than it is at higher altitudes. And Albiruni assumes that when he's looking at the horizon, Light is traveling in a straight line from the horizon to his eye. Now, I don't know if he actually thought that, but it's implicitly assumed in his method. But actually, because the atmosphere is denser at lower elevation, it refracts light. Now, the fact that light bends as it goes from one material to another was already well known, and in fact, Snell's law of refraction was first discovered during Albiruni's lifetime by a man named Ibn Sal. So he may have even been aware of it. But in this case, we're not going from one material to another, we're in the same material, it's just the density's changing. So even if he knew about it, he probably wouldn't have thought it applied to his method. And so it was fair for him to assume that light travels in a straight line. But actually, light doesn't travel in a straight line, light travels according to Fermat's principle, which says that light takes the path of least time. This wouldn't be discovered for a few hundred years. So what does this mean for our experiment? Well, because the atmosphere is denser at the surface of the Earth, light travels slower there, and so light would prefer to be at higher elevation where it can go faster. It's just like if you're driving from one place to another and you want to get there as fast as possible. It could be that taking surface streets is actually the shortest distance, but you can't drive very fast there, so you're better off going out of your way and getting on the highway where you can drive faster, and the total time of travel will be less even though the distance was longer. But if the highway is too far away, then the time you save by driving faster doesn't compensate for the extra time it took just to get to the highway. So similarly with light, even though it wants to be at higher altitude, it doesn't want to deviate too much from the straight line path, as then the time will start to increase again. So the path light will take, instead of being a straight line, will be a special curve in which the time is minimized. Notice that because of this, the horizon is actually further along the Earth's surface than what Albiruni assumes. Now this isn't actually relevant to the experiment. The main problem is that the direction you're looking in when you're looking at the horizon is different from the direction Albiruni thinks he's looking in, and so the angle he measures is too small, resulting in him thinking that the Earth is bigger than it actually is. 
The question is, how big is this error? It could be that this deviation is very small, and so Albedoni's method works perfectly well. Answering this question is a little bit more involved and requires some knowledge of calculus, and in particular of something called calculus of variations. If you'd like to know how to do this, this will be the subject of my next video, Albiruni versus Fermat. If you'd like to see this video, or if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more physics videos in general, subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified when future videos are released. Thanks for watching.